Hi, Life Group Leaders. This is our last lesson for our quarter. Next week, we start a fabulous study of the book of Ephesians, one of the jewels of the New Testament. I think you're going to love that study. Now, I think we could summarize our quarter's study this way, especially 1 Timothy and Titus. We can summarize it with these words. These books give us the, a real good idea on how the church is to operate, especially from the perspective of leaders. Uh, we learn that the leaders are to encourage, they're to correct and reprove, they're to challenge, but most of all, they are to love their people. We've learned that church leadership is not for the weak at heart and requires courage, some boldness, discernment, and focus. And that's really what our final lesson is about. Now by focus I mean that we must keep the main thing the main thing. And the best way to do that is by always reminding ourselves of some of the fundamentals of the church. And uh, Paul helps us in these final words to Titus. In our verses, Paul encourages Titus to remember four fundamentals. Remind that he uses is an imperative, it's a command, with no options if the Christian is to live a life that's pleasing and proper toward God. And so in our text, he's going to say that we should remember, number one, our responsibilities and duties. That's in verses 1 and 2. We should also remember our past. That is verse 3. We should remember our gospel, verses 4 through 7. And then we should remember our mission, and that's given to us in verses 8 through 11, okay? So I don't know how you'll, you'll want to do that. I'm just going to pick up the, the verses as I get to them. And I'm going to begin with, with our responsibility. Now, as you read these two verses, you'll notice that Paul lists eight areas where the leader must remind his church to be mindful of. Now, you can address each of these admonitions, or you can summarize them into one idea and that is respect for authority. And that's what I'm going to do uh, because I think we all agree that authority is taking a hit today, today on every level of society. In fact, this would be a great discussion for you to talk about uh, the lack of authority in different areas of society. I think one thing we can bring out is that respect for authority should not be person-driven but position driven. And I think that's critical, uh, especially with our political climate, sometimes in church, who the leaders are, all of that. If it becomes just personality driven, I think we're going to be in trouble. It has to be position driven. Although I know that liking and not liking individual leaders can be difficult, it's important that positionally we recognize that our leaders are God appointed even if sometimes that makes us scratch our heads. Now here's something to consider. God in his sovereignty has positioned leaders in their roles as he deems right for whatever time frame fits his timetable. And as he works all things of history to his conclusion. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, and the New Testament, we see God selecting people or using people to accomplish his plans. And again, here's a good discussion point to discuss different leaders. Now, in, in my class, I'm going to have someone read Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, and then 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 17, to, to strengthen this idea of respect of authority. I'm probably going to say something like this as well. When there is a lack of respect, then chaos ensues in any organization. And while it, not be, may, while it may not be outright rebellion, there will be disunity. For the church, it may not show itself in blatant atheism in a sense, but it will show itself in practical atheism, living as if there is no God, and the end result will be disunity 
and pain. And so Paul, in his first statement, says to Titus, remind them of their proper authority structure. All right, the second thing he does, he said we should remember our past, and that's in verse 3. And I think the best way to keep from a rebellious spirit that leads to rebellious actions is to look into the mirror of our own lives. Now again, Paul will list eight bad virtues that mark an unsaved person, which is what we were before God captured our heart and we came to know God. In fact, the word foolish means a complete lack of understanding. So when I see or hear or observe words and actions that run contrary to what Paul is writing in this book, I can't help but think, do we really and truly have lost people in our churches? Or maybe we should be more specific. Do we really and truly have lost people in our life groups? Now, granted, some may not have had a proper upbringing by their parents, some may just be immature, but frankly, according to Scripture, this kind of attitude and action is a mark of lostness, and I think this should concern us greatly. So as we look back on our own lives before Christ's grace captured us, we can help discern where others are spiritually. Now, number three, he says we should remember our gospel, verses 4 through seven. Now, isn't it cool how Paul in chapters two and three, in the midst of challenging Titus, how to deal with people and lead with courage, reminds him that his life is to be built around the grace of God. Last week, we looked at the word appeared or appearing, and Paul uses it again in mentioning the gospel again. I tell you folks, divine interruption is a beautiful thing. Now this time he uses that word with regard to some of the virtues or attributes of our Heavenly Father. You might want to notice the words kindness and love and mercy. He reminds Titus to remind the church that salvation is totally through grace, a gift from God alone not by any work of man or merit or what man may deserve, or frankly, by any deeds that man may do. God saved us according to his kind intention and that of his will, by regeneration being made alive, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, and then how he did that through the cross, that dreadful human massacre. God's work of kindness and love were poured out on the cross. That's almost beyond our thinking capacity. Now the phrase poured out richly means to gush out to the brim. Sometimes we say fill it to the brim, which means fill it where we can't get any more into it. And that's the idea of what Christ has done for us. And then Paul adds, this happens by declaration of God. Justification is a sovereign act of his declaration that we're not guilty, with the result that we are placed into his family as an heir. Uh, Think about it. We get the mother load of all that God has and all that God is. Over the last few weeks, Paul and I have been discussing Uh, our end-of-life plans, kind of morbid, you know, kind of, but it's what we've got to do when we reach a certain age. And and we were were discussing on what we desire our wishes to be done for our family. Like I said, it's a sobering thing when you get to a certain age. I was thinking yesterday, as we were kind of walking through some of it, my poor kids, they're not going to get many leftovers. And then this morning, as I'm writing this lesson, I'm thinking, They may not get much, but I'm getting everything that God has. And what a beautiful thought that it is. And then finally, Paul says we should remember our mission. And that is verses 8 through 11. Now, as Paul closes his letter, he addresses three remaining issues for the church. The first is to bear fruit. That's verse 8. As believers, 
we are to do good because it's the right thing to do. It's good. But it's also profitable. Profitable for the individual, but also profitable for the church at large. And so first of all, we as believers, part of God's church, we're to bear fruit. Number two, we're to stay focused, and that's in verse 9. The dangers for all of us is that oftentimes we forget the main thing has always been the main thing in church, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the rest of the stuff that seemed to distract us and divert us and we spend an inordinate amount of time dulls our focus. Whether people go to heaven or hell must be the main priority of the church. Now, Paul uses a pretty strong statement. He uses the word moros, which we get the word moron from, and basically he writes that we should not spend our time on stupid or dull questions. We should stay focused. And what a challenge, but what an important thing it is for us that instead of getting out of bounds and overboard on certain areas, we must remember it's all about the gospel, and the church is to be all about the gospel. You're going to be hearing about a new uh, campaign starting real soon in our church called Who's Your One? And uh, yeah, I think it's going to challenge us. I think it's going to bless us. But it's going to allow us to share the gospel, learn how to share it and share the gospel with many lost people. And so I want you to be thinking right now, who that one person is in your life that the Holy Spirit impresses upon you that you're going to assume gospel responsibility to. And over the next couple months, as you hear more about it, as we begin to pray and preach and teach on it, uh, you'll begin to realize this is the person, this is my one, and this is the person the Holy Spirit has set for me to reach. And then number three, here he says we must also stop factions, and that's in verses 10 and 11. Now, beloved, we are blessed here at our church, but let's be re realistic. Every church has those who try and create schisms or divisions for their own good or profit, whether because of insecurity or baggage from the past or rebellion from authority or dislike of personality. Leaders must be on guard and discerning that our enemy masks himself like an angel of light, but is really a devouring lion, and his best methods are to use people. And so Paul says to Titus, reject these kinds of people. Now, the word reject is also a very strong word that Paul uses. It means to shun or avoid or refuse, or have anything to do with. Don't listen or give time to. The word factious gives us the English word heretic. It's from a root word that is defined this way. Those who place their self-will or their opinions above truth. Every leader, in whatever role they play, must be discerning, must be disciplined, and must be determined to be a good steward of the Lord's church. And that includes me and my role and our pastor's role and our staff's role in our church. But it also includes you, our life group leaders. We want you to know, we try to stress to you, I think, hopefully we do a good job, how important each of you are. Uh, you're important in the study of and the teaching of our weekly lessons. You're important as a pastor to your life group people, that you're to be in contact and loving and caring for them, and also to pass on to us what we need to know. You're also important to be positive and, and uh, to guard against the negative if it should arise or the criticisms that should arise. Uh, it's not an easy thing to which God has called us, but, oh, dear people, what a beautiful thing it is to which God has called us. And I hope these lessons from First and Second Timothy and the lessons that we've learned from Titus will help each of us to be 
uh, the well-balanced stewards of God's church. Thank you so much for what you do. And be, be watching for this, this Who's Your One campaign that's going to be starting real soon. I believe it's going to be uh, incredible. I believe it's going to be encouraging. I also believe it can be church changing. I do believe it'll be eternity changing for many people. And what a blessing for us to be able to get in on God's eternity plans for others. God bless you. I love you folks. And I'm so proud to be part of, of what we do here. Stay with it. Stay focused. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that impacts eternity. Be blessed. Thank you.